This week in the AFL, footy returns with no crowd and fake noise, the Suns belt the Eagles in Queensland, and Port Adelaide retain top spot with 290%. G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we take a look at what happened during round two. Now I'm still kind of figuring out the format of exactly what this video is going to be week to week, but I'm thinking at the moment I'm just going to run through some of my talking points from the round that was. After 12 or so long weeks off, footy kick started again with what should have been a cracking game between the Pies and the Tigers at the MCG, but we were treated to probably one of the lowest scoring draws that I can remember. Collingwood got out to a commanding lead to start the game and kicked one goal after quarter time which led someone like Kevin Bartley to come out and say that this being a potential grand final preview and being one of the worst games he'd seen in a long time the game potentially is in danger as a spectacle now personally I'm not one for high scoring games with a lot of speed and flair I really like the gritty contested style football games so I had no issue with it but let me know in the comments what you think how did that game stack up as a potential grand final preview? Let's be honest, the 2005 grand finals talked about as one of the better grand finals of all time, but that was an absolutely shit game and very comparable to this one. But one thing I do like about the AFL right now is the way they've returned with fake crowd noise. Now, when this was mooted like 10 weeks ago or whatever it was when we were told, you know, football crowds weren't going to be a thing for a while, the idea of fake noise to fill out the stadium seemed really stupid. But I must say, it is so much better having at least a bit of atmosphere while you're watching the footy. It's so eerie listening to the players, you can hear them yelling at each other. I do like how they kind of clearly have like a sound engineer who like turns it up when the ball goes inside. 50. I'm pretty sure I heard boos as well for a holding the ball decision. I did laugh at one point as well when there's obviously cheers automatically to finish the game and at the Collingwood Richmond game they played cheers anyway even though everyone on the field looked distraught. Either way it was a good initiative and I'm totally behind it. Next up is the point you were all waiting for. I have to address the Gold Coast Suns have absolutely annihilated my West Coast Eagles. Now in sweet irony I released two recent videos lately. One saying the Gold Coast Suns never win. I recorded it a week or two ago before the game took place and obviously they've beaten my side. And also in my tips video I tipped us to beat them by 44 points, which ironically is exactly what they smashed us by. You guys should have seen my DMs blowing up during and after the game, and I'm not even talking about my mates, literally just people who subscribe to the channel couldn't wait to rub it in my face that we got slaughtered. I literally had one guy comment in a video saying, ha ha ha, Gold Coast beat the Eagles, also I just subscribed. I mean, thank you, I guess, but still, that hurt. No, but seriously, I don't have a clear explanation for what happened. Gold Coast really played with a lot of intensity and clearly wanted it a lot more. The Eagles, I don't know how to put it, uh, they look like they were exhausted from the get-go. I was watching on TV, every time the ball would sort of spill loose, you'd expect an Eagles player to emerge. And that, it was about four or five Gold Coast players would run onto the ball, they kicked the ball along, and again, we would be outnumbered, which just shows that we clearly weren't running hard enough. Now, how big exactly is that for the context of the season? Well, it means a little bit more than it does most years because you only get to play each team once and getting belted by the bottom side away from home, that does hurt. Now, I don't want to be reactionary and say the Eagles are no longer a contender, but suddenly it is very, very hard to put them up there with the top teams. But they're not the only side that have come back in round two, looking like they haven't quite got the right conditioning. We look at another premiership contender, at least in my eyes, GWS lost at home to the ever gritty North Melbourne. Now, I don't want to disrespect North Melbourne. I know I didn't particularly put them high in my ladder prediction, and I think they're just a club that people overlook. <laughs> now, I don't want to disrespect North Melbourne because I didn't particularly put them high in my ladder prediction, but they are a side, I must admit, it can be easy to overlook. I do think they have good young talent, as I've suggested, but I've also suggested I think they need to add a bit more to that to really develop in the future. But they took it up to GWS. It was clearly a team effort. They looked really good, and somehow they're actually 2-0. and Obviously, they overcame that massive lead St. Kilda had on them in round one, and now they've beaten GWS away. Are they a sneaky shot for the finals? I'm not quite convinced yet, but they will be very, very happy with themselves. Flicking back to Queensland once again for a moment, and despite not really being talked about that much in preseason predictions for the Brownlow, we can see that Nat Fife has absolutely still got it. He was a little bit of a surprise Brownlow winner last year. I knew he would go close, but the way he won it fairly convincingly did shock me, but I think at the moment he's probably close to five, four or five votes out of uh, the first two games so far. Despite playing in a loss, I think there's a good 
good chance he's got three against the Lions here with three goals and 24 possessions, and he almost wrenched his side over the line. Nice little segue here is, the question I ask you, is Nat Fife wasting his career at Fremantle? Joyce and I have done a video on this exact topic yesterday, so go check it out, shameless plug. Now on Friday night, we saw the Hawks made a very rare trip to GMHBA Stadium. In fact, it was their first in 14 years, and gee, it did not end well for them. They lost by 10 goals to an experienced Geelong side, and it kind of prompted Matthew Lloyd to come out and criticize their recruiting strategy, which is funny, he's chosen the time after a big loss for him to make his argument. To be honest, I think it's kind of a strange argument. He basically says that he thinks they've loaded up too much on mature age players like Chad Wingard, your Tom Mitchells, etc., and overlook the draft too much. He says, who is Hawthorne's best young player? James Warper won a best and fairest, but he was pick 40. I'm not really sure where he was drafted is so relevant. Obviously, they didn't draft him high, but they've still got a young player that's just won a best and fairest for them. They've been giving away too many early draft picks, he says, and topping up. The way you win premierships, we're talking about Connor Rosie, Zach Butters, and Xavier Dersma. Now, don't get me wrong. I think those were three great pickups for Port, and it has put them in a really, really good spot for their rebuild. But these guys haven't achieved anything yet, so to make your argument on the basis that these guys are going to win your team a flag, it's fairly flimsy in my opinion. He says Buddy Franklin and Jordan Lewis changed Hawthorne's footy club and he's right. That Hawthorne dynasty, dynasty under Alistair Clarkson was built through the draft and then they topped up really, really well. But looking at Hawthorne's rebuild this time specifically, the players have traded in Tom Mitchell, who's won them a Brownlow medal and helped them finish top four in 2018. But I'm just going through the list now of players they traded in that weren't super expensive. Okay, firstly, you got Jack Gunston back in the day. I know he's been, uh, he's won a few premierships with them. Tom Scully, they got basically for free. Sean Burgoyne, they traded in back in the day as well. Ben McAvoy, a while ago, another trade in. Ricky Henderson traded in for Adelaide, or was he even traded in? He must have cost absolute peanuts. Yes, they have paid big for guys like Wingard, Mitchell, and O'Meara, but those, those guys are all 26 and under and still going to be very, very important players. Look, I think it's a fair debate. Have Hawthorne gone about their rebuild the right way? Maybe, maybe not, but I think to bring it up after round two and make the points he did, it could have been done better. Another team that has sort of circumvented their rebuild process with trades was St. Kilda, and that is a club that I normally get a lot of grief for for disrespecting in my tips videos. Now, I know this is gonna sound like I'm just saying it, but I was so close to changing my tip at the last minute for the Saints over the dogs. I do have to ask though, there's an important qualification here. Is St. Kilda playing really well, or are the dogs just really, really shit at the moment? I don't want to discredit St. Kilda because I think they've played really good patches so far in the first two rounds. Obviously, they couldn't get it done against North. They fell away badly. But I think the football they're playing is at least improved. I do think the dogs, though, do really suck, and I think Beveridge is under a lot of pressure. Probably a bit early to start asking about pressure on coaches, but from his perspective, things look really, really bad at the kettle. So to summarize that point, I think the Saints are moving in the right direction, but I will still need to see it for an extended period of time if I'm going to have them a chance to play finals. In some other good news for the league, we saw Harley Bennell made his return to football after over a 1,000 days. He had 14 possessions at 83%, and most importantly, he got through unscathed and thankfully his team had a win although it really wasn't a blockbuster clash another team worth noting is port adelaide who obviously won their battle to wear the bars in their showdown and boy did they do it justice they suddenly sit on top of the ladder after two rounds with 290 percent at the moment they're looking like they've got a really good mix down there with youth in particular the guys we've mentioned like rosie butters and dersma and also todd marshall had a really good game up forward as well now of course They've only played Gold Coast and Adelaide, who at the start of the season I predicted to be the bottom two. I'm not too sure whether that's accurate, but Gold Coast did play really shit against them in round one. Long story short, 290% is a great result. Wasn't against great opponents, but at the end of the day, you can only beat who's in front of you. They've got free mantle this week. Can they go 3-0? I think they can. One last point I kind of want to note in this discussion about, you know, shorter quarters and the effect it's having on the game, particularly with teams that are having less preparation 
well, certainly between rounds one and two, you know, after isolation, not every team got, you know, the preseason they wanted. But let's look at the, some weird games that are happening here. Richmond kicked seven goals in the first quarter against Carlton, only won by 24 points. The Blues absolutely slaughtered them in the last quarter. As we moved down, Essendon, I remember, got a massive lead on Fremantle, ended up only winning the game by six points. The game we mentioned before, North, were trailing St Kilda by something like five or six goals in the third quarter and ended up winning the game by two points. In round two, albeit it was low scoring, Collingwood with several goals in front of Richmond and looked like they were completely in control control and absolutely went to water in the second half. Potentially the best example of this is Melbourne. We're leading by 42 points and their total score was only 54 at the end and only beat Carlton by a point. That right there is five games in two rounds that so really weird scoring patterns. Is there something to it? I don't know. We're going to have to pay attention as the weeks wear on. All right, one last segment in this True Footy Reacts video. I want to give each team that played this weekend a letter grade for their performance. We'll start at the top, Richmond versus Collingwood. It was a draw, a lackluster draw. But I've given both teams a C plus because they didn't drop points against a major competitor against them this season. Geelong and Hawthorne straight forward as rivals this year, well, rivals every year, but particularly competing, in my opinion, for similar spots on the ladder. I've given the Cats an A+, and the Hawks a resounding F. Brisbane get a C plus for their small win over Fremantle. They really, really were, should never have lost that game, but Fremantle actually did play well. That's why I've given them a B. Carlton and Melbourne, this was a tough one. I've given Carlton a C because on paper, they've lost to a side that I had slightly better than them by one point. And Melbourne, similarly, I've given a C because they've beaten a team I think they should have beaten by a point. Although, to be honest, they definitely could have been far more convincing about it. Port Adelaide get an A+, and Adelaide get an F for their showdown. Performance is pretty straightforward. Unsurprisingly, Gold Coast get an A+, for uh, smashing West Coast, who get an F. GWS again, an F for losing at home to North Melbourne. While I don't think North are a bad side at all, they do get an A+, for beating a potential premiership contender last year's grand finals on their home deck. That's a huge result for them. Sydney versus Essendon's more even. I gave Sydney a C plus because they're coming up against a side who played finals last year. And in my opinion, Sydney are rebuilding and Essendon get an A because even though I do say Sydney are rebuilding, they're actually still a hard team to beat in Sydney. So both teams, I think, walk away fairly happy from that game. And finally, St. Kilda, an A plus performance for beating the Dogs very, very easily despite being lesser fancied in my opinion. And the Bulldogs have just been shithouse in the first two rounds. They get two Fs in a row. Anyway, guys, before we round up, I will give a shout out to the leaderboard of our AFL Fantasy League. It is Taz Wood with the team, the Thug Life, with a 1677 average. Still getting used to these lower scores. It's hard to get your head around and hard to be excited about a score of like 1600. But well done, Taz. You are leading the league. That's it, guys. That's all we have for this week's True Footy Reacts. Make sure to subscribe if you're new, like the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.